Good afternoon, DEC members, and a special welcome to members of the Economic Club of New York, guests invited by NBS Commercial Interiors and Steelcase Employees. My name is Steve Gregorian. I'm the CEO of the Detroit Economic Club, and it's a pleasure to have you all with us today. Certainly hope everyone's enjoying a gorgeous month of August. For today's meeting, you're all muted, but we do want you to submit questions via the Zoom chat room and we will get to those as part of today's program. After we say goodbye to our guest speaker at 2 o'clock, sorry, we invite DEC members to stick around for 15 minutes and participate in a structured virtual networking session with other DEC members, and that will conclude 15 minutes after we start. I do wanna take a brief moment to thank the 125 terrific DEC sponsors for their support of our mission. And you saw those companies while you were logging in. I also wanna have a special thank you to DEC board member, Rich Schwabauer, along with Lori Powell, both of NBS Commercial Interiors for their assistance with today's program. Our guest today is in a business that was delivered a sweeping curveball called COVID-19, just like the rest of us. Jim Keene is president and CEO of Steelcase, a global leader in the office furniture industry. Jim has been with Steelcase for 23 years and was appointed CEO in 2014. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree in accountancy from the University of Illinois and a master's in management degree from the Kellogg Graduate School of Management at Northwestern University. Jim Keen, great to see you today. Thanks for being with us and the floor is yours. Thank you, Steve. And uh, thank you for uh, welcoming me back to DEC. It's great to be uh, back with this group. And uh, it's been uh, a remarkable year. So let's just kind of keep score here. We've had a global pandemic that has radically changed our business and the way we all work. Uh, racial injustice, which is a very serious issue, and all the related social unrest and protests that go with that. And that, that's affected every company. It's affected our people. It's affected our communities. Uh, an economic downturn triggered by those other factors. And we've seen, we've seen economic downturns before, but this one sure feels different. And it's not over. We have a big election coming in a few months. That could paralyze things in Washington at a time when we really need crisp decision making. And meanwhile, we're all trying to run our businesses. And uh, I was talking to a new CEO yesterday and I told him, it's not always like this. Like every year won't be like this year. Um, and it's, that's probably a good thing. At Steelcase, we learned a lot this year. You know, nearly every factory around the world was closed for some period of time. Uh, we had always thought our Michigan factories had the lowest risk. You know, when we do business continuity planning, I'm sure all you guys do things like that. Uh, we assess risk uh, and we, we always thought the Michigan factories had the lowest risk compared to some plants we operate around the world but the Michigan plants were actually the most challenged this time by local restrictions and so on. So we learned a lot going through this crisis. We also closed our offices for a while and afterwards we adopted new protocols, made modifications to the furniture and the facilities to increase safety. We reopened our offices and started inviting people back, starting with the folks working on producing masks and PPE for local hospitals. And then uh, people supporting essential business customers we have, that was kind of the next wave. Uh, and eventually people supporting our entire business. So, um, so people were working from home and working from home worked okay for a part of everyone's job, but nearly every job we have here in Michigan depends on people working with each other, uh, working with each other formally in meetings, but also informally. And frankly, jobs that don't require people to be working in proximity with their colleagues, jobs that you could do fully, you could do them from home, those jobs, for us at least, don't really have to be in Michigan. I mean, they could be anywhere in the United States. And in fact, they don't even have to be in the United States. They could be in a lower cost place. But we don't believe that's true. We don't believe we have many jobs in Michigan like that. We believe it is important for people to work together in truly human ways. It's how people build trust. It's how they learn. It's critical to the jobs. It's critical to the teams. It's critical to the way we position ourselves with customers. It's critical to our culture. So I'll just elaborate on that a little bit. Collaboration while working at home is really mostly working on video. We've all gotten used to that. And there's a lot to like about that. And there's no commuting, first of all, like you get up and you can be at work in two minutes. The meetings all start right on time and they all end right on time. And uh, you know, that's not true in the office. And uh, with one click, you're off to the next meeting. 
But, you know, I did a lot of good things. I'm sure you could think back on when you worked in the office. Those five minutes before a meeting started, those were an opportunity for me to kind of catch a colleague who might be presenting in that meeting, offer them a little coaching or a little bit of encouragement before the meeting. Or sometimes, you know, I might have my best idea five minutes after the meeting and people are still kind of wrapping up and I can kind of grab a colleague and say, hey, you know, I had one more thought about that. Uh, and that those kinds of things just don't happen today. You know, with the click of the mouse, I'm instantly off to the next meeting and so are they. So those little things that used to happen in the margins um, aren't happening anymore. Similarly, in the past, on a day like this where I'm in my office, I'd walk through our building, I'd see a couple people talking, maybe people I hadn't seen for a while, and I would just kind of walk up and join that conversation for a couple minutes, and then I'd move on. Or I'd be waiting in line for my coffee, and I'd meet someone I hadn't seen before, maybe introduce myself to, to a colleague or uh, visit with someone who was maybe visiting from Europe that I haven't seen in a while. Th these are spontaneous moments that don't happen today. You know, somewhere in out on out the internet, there's probably a, a video stream with a couple staircase people uh, talking to each other right now, but I don't know that. I can't see them. I don't know that meeting exists unless I was actually invited to the call. So it's become very binary. You're either in the meeting or you're not. It's like every meeting now is in a room with a door. And I, I don't know unless I'm invited where those meetings are. And in the past, it definitely wasn't like that. I would see people collaborating everywhere, standing in the hallway, sitting in lounge furniture, et cetera. So for leaders, I think you all know the value of those moments, those moments of spontaneous interaction. It's why we walk around. And it, it's a key part of how we lead. We're not just taking a break. We're shaping culture. We're staying connected. And so, yes, I can do my job from home. You can do your job from home over video. But there's some really important parts of what we do that made us really good at what we do that you can't do unless you're present and unless the people you work with are also present. Now, you might be thinking you could just schedule one-on-one -on -one sessions with people you want to talk to. And yes, of course, and I do that too. But it's not the same. The spontaneity is the whole point. It's the fact that I stopped what I was doing to come up and join that conversation. That's part of the magic. It's part of what makes those kinds of interactions feel human and natural. So we believe, it's still case anyway, that it's essential to get our people back to the office and to do it in a way that's safe. Right now, today, we have a little bit more than 25% of our office-based Michigan workforce in our facilities every day. Uh, we're inviting more people to return to the office and our numbers are rising every week. Uh, this week, in fact, it was just yesterday, one of our employees posted a very inspiring story on our internal blog about what it has felt like for him to, as he said, get up early, pack his lunch and go back to the office. He described a story that I, I describe it as a story of resilience and recovery. And it was so inspiring to read what he wrote kind of on his own. It also gives you a picture into what people are really feeling as they try to get by while working from home. You know, the fact that he mentioned getting up earlier, making lunch, what he's talking about there are things that create structure in our lives. And one of the things we know people are missing right now is a sense of structure in their work life and the definition or separation of work life from home life. So maybe that's just kind of one example, the things we do as we get ready to go to work. I think there's a lot of stories like that out there. We see it in our surveys we do, and we've surveyed thousands of people in the US and all around the world. Um, and maybe I'll share a little bit of what, what we've learned. So for senior leaders, so it's like people like me, and for many of you, uh, working at home has gone reasonably well. We have big homes, we have dedicated offices or a converted bedroom that's no longer in use. Uh, we have ergonomic furniture. Um, I certainly have ergonomic furniture. If you don't have ergonomic furniture, just give me a call, <laughs> glad to help. Um, but for middle managers, we hear a different story. They, have, they may have a working spouse at home, they may have kids at home, and they don't really have the space they need to do this well. They're sharing the dining room, they're sharing the living room, they do video calls from the laundry room. We're hearing all these stories, literally stuff like that. And they're getting through it. They're getting through it, but, but they all fear what would happen otherwise. If I, if I engage more in society, will I get sick? If I go back to the office, will I get sick? What's gonna happen when school starts this fall? Tensions in any family relationship are all getting magnified as people are hunkered down together in these homes. And for younger employees, it's even worse. So with younger employees, they're sharing small apartments with roommates or they're living in small studio apartments. And this is becoming a real challenge. In fact, you probably know, I certainly do, a lot of young people have moved back home with their parents. And 
you know, as a reminder, if we had surveyed them in February, moving back with your parents was not their dream. This was not in the plan for 2020. Uh, so, so their concerns about what's happening in society on top of a change in their lifestyle, it's, it's not, and wondering, like, will my job get eliminated? You take all those things together and it's not going well for young people right now. So senior executives doing reasonably well based on the surveys, middle managers facing unique challenges, young people facing even more, uh, more um, concerning challenges. Uh, and that's just a little bit from the survey. Glad to answer more questions about that. Uh, we also hear, by the way, I'm sure you've read articles about uh, productivity and is productivity holding up while everybody's working at home? And these productivity measures are generally used for task-based work because we've studied productivity in the workplace for a long time. So things like the numbers of claims processed or customer service calls taken, uh, those are the things you can measure easily with productivity statistics. It's notoriously difficult to measure productivity as it relates to innovation or transformation, organizational change, uh, negotiation, persuasion. Uh, these are really the high value tasks of knowledge workers, really hard to measure. And by the way, if you step back from the detailed measures, we all know GDP is way down, down record levels. Unemployment is a growing problem. So at the level of society, there's no question we're not as productive as we were last year. So, so all that taken, and, and then maybe at a minimum, even if you had measures of statistics, I think any measurement we had right now would be super noisy. And, uh, and we have all kinds of data, human data. It says that from a human perspective, there's a lot of challenges people are facing as they work from home. So what's the future hold? And there's a lot of hype out there about this. Uh, we've been studying work, worker, and workplace forever. Uh, we've managed through, as a company, we've been around for 109 years. We've managed through the shift from private office to open plan, from cubicles to desking systems and benching, and then more recently from, from a own workstation model where everybody got their own desk, to shared workstations, hoteling models, uh, to co-working and back again. And so we've, we've been through a lot. We've learned a lot from all of those transitions. And to some degree, this uncertainty about where the office is going next is always like that for us at Steelcase. So uh, we've seen everything. You know, we've seen predictions of the paperless office. And 25 years later, we still sell a lot of file cabinets. Uh, when laptops came out, we were all going to be working from the beach. And there's no question that technology changes the way we work and changes the workplace. But the, the predictions that come out of the technology industry usually get it wrong because they don't focus enough on what people need. And that's the human side of the equation. And that's really where we focus. What do people actually need uh, as, they, as they work alone and they work with their colleagues? So here's what we believe will happen. Here's how we are looking at the future of work. First of all, despite everything I said, I think working from home will be a, a more important part of how nearly everyone works. So working from home will be a bigger part of, of how nearly everyone works. And for most people, that might be like a day or two a week. For some people, it'll be more, some people will be less, but ideally it's a matter of their choice. So they may choose to work at home on a day where there's a task they need to do for work. And, and for that particular task, they just think a change of scenery might make sense. Like working from home that day, I think we all can relate to that. We've all done that from time to time. You gotta get something written, you gotta get a document finished, and you just need that kind of change of scenery. Or maybe they have something they have to attend to in their life, in their home life. And being at home that day works best. And we've all been through that as well. I think what will change here is that most companies will, will sunset the idea that you have to be in the office every day to be effective. So for companies that have always had that as a rule, and we haven't had that rule in forever, but for companies that have that kind of a rule, those kinds of rules are going to quietly go away because people know now that it doesn't have to be like that. I don't have to be controlled. I can work from home periodically and I can be effective. Uh, what will also change, though, and it's happening right now, is companies are recognizing that if homework is part of the equation, that it's got to be safe and it's got to be healthy. And so they, they're working with their employees to make sure that they've got ergonomic furniture, and, and they're calling us and asking us to be part of uh, those solutions. So we're doing programs uh, with, with companies who are asking us to provide furniture for all their employees or to provide a vehicle to which employees can order furniture, uh, or we're engaging just directly with individuals at home. So. Uh, home, my, my comments earlier about working from home are really the idea of permanent all the time working from home versus what we think is going to be a big deal. Okay, so that's the working from home part. What about the office? And, and I think people are speaking about this part less, and I think this is actually deserves more attention. And that's because 
one thing that doesn't change is competition. So every company is always competing and we're always looking for that, that little advantage. And the idea that your office can be a competitive advantage is not a new idea. I mean, Microsoft and Google and Apple have made those investments and those CEOs are continuing to talk about the importance of getting people back in their workplace when the time is right. But the workplace will change. So one way it'll change is, is that now that people have had a chance to have um, more focus, let's say for people who do have offices at home or don't have some of the distractions that I talked about, for those people when they come back to the office, it won't be acceptable anymore that they can't find a place to concentrate when they need to or a place to have a private conversation when they need to. Nobody should feel like they have to go home to be productive. So we're gonna see more enclaves, more small kind of cordoned off areas, spaces like this is my office, but it's a, it's a little space. I can literally touch both walls and uh, it's about eight feet long. So it's a very small space, but it's a place I can do video calls and I can uh, concentrate when I need to. And, and whether they're owned like my office or shared and used on demand, we expect we're gonna see a lot more of this kind of um, micro architecture in the office. Uh, secondly, meeting spaces are gonna have to more fully support remote participants. And uh, I'll just talk about this briefly. So up until now, when we've been on Zoom calls and Teams calls and all the other kinds of calls out there, we've had complete democracy. Every person gets a square, it's exactly the same size, we're all in the same spot. Like we're all calling in from somewhere and we're all alone. As we go back to the office, and we can see that already, that's still cases, our people have been back. You're gonna have more meetings where half the people are in a space together and half the people might be calling in from home or somewhere else. And over time, it's gonna be more like three quarters of the people will be in the office and maybe 25% of the people are calling in from somewhere. And the people who are remote are not gonna accept being reduced to the speakerphone anymore. I mean, they know what this has felt like and they're not gonna be okay with that. Uh, they're also not gonna be okay with, with being portrayed in that meeting room in a way where their, their presence is somehow less than the people who are physically present. I mean, everybody's gonna to wanna to feel like they have an equal voice. That's gonna be harder than and you might think we've already seen some of the challenges of it. So we think meeting spaces are going to have to be designed differently so they more fully support remote participants. Offices are also going to have to be more flexible and resilient because we just went through all this and we know that sometimes we have to be able to expand the space and contract the, the space as conditions change. So clients are already asking us this. They're saying, how do we have spaces where more of the interior architecture is reconfigurable, flexible, maybe even more things that can be moved by the employees themselves as they move from individual work to teamwork, or they just, they need to make a change based on what they happen to need right there in the moment. So uh, more flexible spaces is something we're hearing a lot about. And then finally, safety. And safety is a big deal. Not just that offices have to be safe, but they have to feel safe. And the, the goal here, uh, once we get past uh, the next uh, several months, is to be able to be in the office and do it without masks. So right now, everywhere I go in the office, except for spaces like this, I'm wearing my mask. And that's the way it is for almost all of our clients. But down the road, we wanna be able to work in a more natural human way, to see facial expressions, to feel comfortable in the office. And so being able to design offices in the longer run so we can do it without masks um, is gonna be super important. And uh, how do you achieve that? Well, first of all, you achieve it through separation. So the six foot of separation rule, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, is a good start. And today our research, we've actually looked at all the, the workstations we've uh, configured and delivered over the last 10 years, and uh, about 70% of them don't comply with that six foot rule. Uh, as you have workstations that are close to or slightly under six feet, you're also gonna see people adding barriers. So screens and other kind of light scale partitions, to supplement distance. So distance is one way of offering protection, but barriers is a second way. And the six foot rule, by the way, isn't even a rule. Like the virus doesn't know about the rule. So uh, it, as it turns out, if you cough towards somebody, if you sneeze towards somebody, uh, the, the particles will travel far more than six feet in a straight line. And we're working with uh, scientists at MIT to understand that more completely and to come up with ways of thinking about barriers and separation in a way that's actually science-based and can uh, reduce the risk of transmission uh, in an office environment. Uh, materials is another part of safety. So materials that offer some level of pathogen resistance without creating other problems like, uh, like um, um, superbugs and so on. Uh, materials that can support cleaning. Uh, so cleaning is an interesting thing we've already discovered here at Steelcase 
as we've had people come back into the office, we have shared spaces, meeting rooms, and the, and the protocol that we're all going to get used to, just like you know, a few months ago, we weren't used to masks, uh, is now cleaning in and cleaning out. So when you arrive in a, at a, in a team space at, for your two o'clock meeting, you grab a wipe, you wipe down your area, you wipe down the arms of the chair, and then you have the meeting, and when you're done, you wipe it down again out of uh, courtesy for the people who might follow you in there. And that just becomes a really natural part of how we work. So the, the surfaces that the furniture is made out of has to be able to support constant cleaning by the users, as well as facilities cleaning at the end of the day. Some people have asked us a lot about shared workstations. So what's the future? He was on a CEO call yesterday. He was asking me about, you know, what's the future of shared workstations and hoteling? And there's really two schools of thought on this. For organizations that think that they're going to have less work from home, uh, less sharing is better because you have less opportunity for somebody to be sitting at a desk and then they get up and they leave and somebody sits down right after them and, and maybe they, they skip the clean and clean out protocol and then you have a, a weakness in the system. So less sharing is better, but, uh, but we believe that most clients, as I said earlier, are gonna see more work from home. As a result, sharing is likely a necessity. So cleaning and protocols are important. Um, real estate footprint, footprint changes are possible, but we actually think it's mostly gonna stay the same. Some companies may adopt like the big central office satellite office, home office idea, uh, but that's most likely the two scenarios we're gonna see. And then managing to transition is always uh, challenging. We can share a lot with you if you're interested about how we've gone through there. In short, I'd say it's about giving people choices. So for now, inviting people back and then encouraging people back as you want to improve team effectiveness and so on. And then eventually expecting people back uh, when the time is right and, and you feel it's right for your business and, and right for and right because of the safety of the environment in which we're working. Um, so that gives you a, maybe a, a sense of some of the things we're doing. My last appeal uh, on all of this is to, um, is to recognize that businesses can make, make a difference in the world. We can make a difference in the lives of our people. Um, so our people, your people, we need the structure, the purpose, the connection, uh, the sense of progress that comes from work and, and from being at work and going to work. Uh, those human connections are social and they help us recharge. They help us thrive. They help us feel like we're, we're not just getting through this, we're actually growing, we're learning, we're succeeding. And as leaders, we do that best by being human, uh, being uh, who we are, being the, best at, uh, being the best leaders we can be. So uh, Steve, maybe I'll pause there and turn it back to you. Yeah, Jim, thanks. Your thought leadership on this topic is really fascinating. So thank you for uh, your ideas. I did want to focus a bit now because I think you've done a really good job of describing our future work environments. But I want to talk about leadership and um, some maybe some lessons you've learned. But uh, can you just talk about one or two things that leaders can do to create a good remote culture? Yeah, so first of all, finding lots of ways to connect. So as leaders, we're really good at connecting with people when they're visible face-to-face. -face. Uh, you really have to work at it when they're not. So you have to go beyond the scheduled meetings and, and schedule more one-on-ones, more short meetings, uh, more roundtables. In fact, I, I do a thing called roundtables where it's randomly selected people from around the company and we just have lunch virtually so that the remote workers all over the country uh, can have a few minutes to, to just talk about how things are going. And, and it's really not about me answering questions or giving a talk. It's me listening and feeling and understanding what they're going through. So remote participants often say that uh, we need more communication. And we think as leaders that that means that they need to hear more from us about what's going on. So communication is a two-way street. So they need more vehicles where they can talk and they can be listened to. And heard. And secondly, it's this thing I mentioned earlier about making sure that a remote participant feels equal. That that uh, you know, go out of your way in a meeting when you're in meetings that are hybrid, where you have people face to face and you've got people who are remote, to draw the remote participants into the conversation, so they don't feel like they're interrupting, which is something we hear a lot. Um, and then uh, finally, coaching and development and those kinds of things that happen naturally and spontaneously for people who are mostly remote, we have to be more intentional about those. Terrific. Um, are there some crisis management principles that you've learned going through this pandemic that you think might stay with you for the long term? Yeah, so I, I was thinking about the crisis and thinking about before the crisis, I thought I was in a crisis and then the crisis happened. So I'm starting to think that business is just like this. And it's not like this, but the things we did to get through the crisis could actually be helpful like all the time. So some of the principles we've used is 
first of all, when you deal with something that's kind of ambiguous and new, we always try to pick a person to be in charge of it because our org structure wasn't designed for it. So to manage a crisis like this, we needed to have operations and legal and, and uh, finance and marketing and sale. I mean, everybody had to be thinking like a team. And so we, we, would pick, we picked a person who actually is a direct report of mine, Sarah Armbruster, and asked her to delegate everything else she does to other people and do this full time during the crisis. And so that's the first thing we do, we do is really clarify decision making, uh, recognizing your organization wasn't designed for it. Uh, second thing is the practice. So we practice crises all the time. We have micro crises and larger crises. We always use the same approach. So when th this big crisis hit, we didn't have to tell everybody, like, here's how we're going to do it. They, they knew the game plan. They've, they've seen this play be called before. A uh, third thing is to increase your cadence. So the cadence of our organization, like any organization, is set up in quarterly, monthly, weekly, daily things we do. Um, but, you know, we, we seldom manage the same thing every day. When you're in a crisis like this, the, the information's changing. It's so dynamic. That you have to, it's changing all the time. And so we, we entered into a daily stand-up meeting with the leadership, senior leadership team, and we didn't know what we were going to talk about from day to day, but we just showed up, and there was always plenty. Um, and then the last thing is there's a tendency in a crisis to centralize all the decision-making, and you could not make a worse mistake. So Team of Teams is a book I love on this topic. Um, what you learn is that you should centralize certain things like uh, critical decision making, um, principles, uh, culture and values, communication, but you decentralize everything else. So literally, I went to bed one night, got up the next morning and learned that one of our colleagues had closed down a factory because he thought it was the right thing to do and he made the right decision. He didn't wait for me to get up. Um, and uh, that's the kind of uh, pace you need in a crisis like this. I want to turn to a couple of people that have sent um, some chats in. Uh, Nick asks, how much do you think your clients will support their employees' workspace at home? Will they provide furniture, IT equipment, and setups for their employees working from home? Yeah, so a lot of them have already started to do that, and we're getting actually a lot of demand for that. Um, sometimes they're doing it directly, where they're actually just picking up the furniture and then uh, shipping it to the employees. More often, they're asking us to set up um, uh, online catalogs where it's pre-negotiated prices and the employees can go in and select the furniture they, they need because they may already have a desk at home or they may already have a chair. Uh, ergonomics is where I'd start. So I'd think about the chair and I would think about things like a, a height adjustable monitor or a desk, but those are the things that people need the most and it's the things they miss the most from being in the office. Good, we've got uh, just a couple minutes left and I'm gonna give you a chance to uh, uh, a free steel case advertisement. Kareem wants to know, has Steelcase developed any new products in response to the pandemic? We have. So in the short run, what we developed was uh, lots of screens and things like that. So the healthcare world was the first to adopt it because they wanted to keep their people safe as you know, patients and clients were coming to those facilities. We, we then took a lot of those ideas and used it to create a variety of partitions and screens that people can deploy into existing furniture, including some of it that's um, disposable and made from recycled materials and recycled at the end of its life. Because for some clients, they say, you know, I need this for now, but I mean, I need it forever. Uh, and then, but as it relates to other things, we just had a broad product line to begin with. So we're helping people understand, like for work from home furniture, for example, what parts of our existing product line would be most relevant. And a final steel case, case plug. You've been talking about ergonomic furniture. I'm sitting on my kitchen bar stool, which is the antithesis of ergonomics. <laughs> so what are you sitting in? What do you like uh, from your product line right now uh, while you're doing your work all day? Well, what I, this chair I work in all the time at home and here is the gesture chair. So gesture is our flagship chair. It's the, it's the top selling chair too. So it's, it's the chair most of our clients have purchased over the last few years. Um, and so that's my choice. Uh, another ch chair I suggest actually for those of you who have kids who are going to be studying at home, uh, Series 1 is a very affordable chair. Uh, it's at the other end of the spectrum in terms of cost, but it's also a really good chair, you know, and, and it's, I've, got, I've got one of those uh, at my cottage and uh, that's what my kids have been using when they've been working from home and studying from home. That's awesome. Well, Jim, I promise you, you could get on to your next meeting at two o'clock and we're about there. So I want to say thank you uh, for your incredible insights and thought leadership into our current and future work world. I also want to thank your team and uh, my team. And folks, if you are signing off now, DEC members, you are going to get a survey 
and you know that it will just take you 30 seconds to fill out. We do read those and we wanna keep getting better and better in our new virtual meetings world. So thank you again, Jim. Great to be with you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, everybody.